Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we're going to look at running horror adventures for your tabletop role-playing game. My regular viewers should have figured out by now that I am a huge fan of horror. I'm even a horror author, and while there are certainly a lot of strong horror elements in a lot of the stories that I write, Hanassier is the only one that I consider to be my only straight horror novel. I've talked about various horror games, especially Call of Cthulhu, which is my favorite tabletop role-playing game, and I've written scenarios for that. I've previously done videos on running mysteries and running heists, and have been repeatedly asked when it is I plan to broach horror. Well, today is that day. Horror can be done with just about any tabletop role-playing game. The game system itself doesn't really matter, so whether you're wanting to run a horror game using Dungeons & Dragons or Star Trek, that is all perfectly fine. However, some systems are a little bit more conducive to horror than other games are. So while yes, you can certainly run a great horror game with a, a high combat, epic hero sort of fantasy system like that, it can be a bit trickier to pull off. Now, before we begin, as I said with my other How to Run videos, there are exceptions to all these tips and suggestions that I'm about to give. Uh, I can personally name a few brilliant ones myself, so if you do have an idea for a horror game that doesn't quite match everything that I'm talking about here today, that is perfectly fine. Knock yourself out. There are a lot of ways to do it. However, these are all tips that are definitely worth considering, and not just exclusively for horror, but with other types of tabletop role-playing game themes as well, but definitely ones you should consider for horror. Okay, disclaimers out of the way, let's get this thing started. The first thing when you're considering horror games is to first consider what horror is. Unlike when we covered heists and mysteries, those are plots, what the characters are tasked to do. Horror is not the plot, it's the mood that we're trying to achieve through the game, and not as much for the characters as we're trying to achieve this for the players. And despite what many people believe, horror is not about scaring your audience. Your players don't have to be afraid to have a successful horror game. Horror, just as a genre itself, is about eliciting discomfort in your audience. You know, repulsion, disgust, unease, dread, and of course, fear can be one of those. But the enjoyment that we get from horror, the, the rush that we get, is from the discomfort that we feel without crossing the line into where it no longer becomes fun for everybody. Now, the idea of seeking out discomfort might seem a bit odd for some people, and those are probably some pretty boring people if they find that odd. So think of it like peppers. Capsaicin is an irritant. It's believed that plants develop this in order to keep certain animals from eating them. But in the right quantities, it enhances food, making it stimulating. We seek it out despite the fact that it's technically an irritant. Certain elements are just associated with horror. You know, monsters, haunted castles, full moons, body horrors, that sort of thing. And while yes, those elements are certainly useful if you're trying to get a good horror game going, Horror elements themselves don't make something horror. Remember that the mood is what we're going for. Many games out there have monsters. I mean, look at Dungeons and Dragons, Mind Flayers and Beholders. They're weird and alien with writhing tentacles, and they are formidable opponents, yes, but having one inside a game doesn't suddenly just make it a horror game. Vampires can be horror, or they could be comedy, so the elements themselves don't make something horror. It's what they do and how they're presented. So describe the setting and the monsters. Give the details, not just of the jewel and the blood, blood dripping from the monster's fangs, but how it moves. Does it move like a person, or does it move in sort of a, a herky-jerky way, or does it seem to glide like it's going through water? Give me the sounds that it gives, the squelching as it moves, the clicking of hooves or claws on the floor, the jingling of chains that are sewn through its flesh, its labored breathing. Give me the smells. And don't just say, oh, it smells foul, but show me in ways that I can associate with that, you know, things that are familiar to me. Does it smell like rotted meat or does it smell like soured milk? Uh, to increase the weirdness, you might want to add a little bit more discomfort to it by having it smell like something they're not expecting, like sweet, like lilies or wine childlike giggle or something like that, or maybe it smells like the player character's father's cologne. To make something strange and menacing does not mean that it by itself has to be scary. The discomfort can just come from the fact that it's just so far out of place. 
Paint the setting and the creatures with not just the details that describe it, but with the details that'll sell the mood and the response that you're going for through it. So in order to be able to hit that mood of you know being able to uh, have it be enjoyable, but also uncomfortable at the same time, that can be pretty tricky to pull off. And the easiest and most effective way to start doing that is to get your players on board with you. So tell your players that this is a horror game. Yes, it can be possible and a lot of fun to surprise them with a horror game when they're not expecting it, and when that works, that just works beautifully. But the majority of the time, a horror game works better if your players come in expecting it to be a horror game. First, they're going to be more receptive to it. If they come in knowing that they're going to be at this game having fun with uncomfortable things, then they're going to be more apt to lean into it and get into the mood for it. And second, and very importantly, they're more likely to keep that mood going because they know that that's the goal for this game. If they don't know that this is going to be a mood game, then they might break that mood by joking around and shattering the tone that you've worked so hard in order to achieve it, and now you're getting frustrated with them and they're getting frustrated with you because we're not all on the same page as what it is we're trying to do. So just go ahead and tell your players ahead of time what the goal is. Most players, if they know that this is the goal of the game, not only are they less likely to resist going that direction because they know that's the direction that everybody is wanting to go, but they're more inclined to help you and everybody else achieve that goal. Gaming is a group effort, as I've always said, so not only tell the players that this is a horror game, but charge them with helping you and everybody else at the table get into the mood for maximum enjoyment. Since I mentioned players might break the tension with a joke or something like that, and sometimes that happens, even in the real world, it's a normal response that we have. So if there's a moment that they start laughing, let them laugh. In the movie The Thing, one of the best horror movies of all time, that has got a lot of very funny moments that happen during some very tense situations, and those moments improve the movie more than they detract from it. So don't have a no laughing, otherwise you'll ruin the game policy. No, we are here to have fun, and sometimes horror requires that we have a good laugh every now and then in order to relieve the tension. So if your players laugh, let them. But if your players know and they're committed to everybody having a good time with a horror game, and that's going to be the objective here, they can help with not just policing themselves, that way the game just doesn't devolve down into complete silliness, but they can help you quickly rebuild that mood that everybody is going for and recover from that joke a whole lot faster. Since we're going for a mood game, you might want to set the mood at the table. Turn down the lights, maybe add some candles, play some good mood music. That's fine. I've used all of those things before and they can work great. I've even done a video on using music and ambient sounds. Just remember that all of these things are to enhance the experience and not detract from it. So still keep enough light in the room for everybody to see their character sheets or be able to read the books and keep the music low enough that way they can still hear each other and hear you without having to raise their voices. While horror can be done as a single adventure within a larger campaign or as a larger campaign itself, one-shot adventures are spectacular for horror. In regular, long-running campaigns, uh, characters are assumed to have a reasonable chance of surviving until that campaign's climax, and a sudden character death after a lot of time and energy has been put into a character in the middle of a campaign, that can be disappointing for everybody at the table. One-shot adventures, on the other hand, which I've discussed previously in another video, they don't have that same feel. They feel more like a horror movie, where death might be around the corner for anyone or all the player characters at any time, which only increases that fear. That's why the Alien RPG calls one-shot cinematic play, just to emphasize that dramatic difference that one-shots can have in a horror game. Another thing, that while heroic fantasy RPGs might regularly see large groups with five, six, or seven or more players operating with no problem at all, Horror games tend to work better with smaller, three to four person groups. And one-on-ones where it's just the player and just the game master, those can work spectacular for horror games. Small groups not only help because it's e easier to maintain and tailor the mood when you've got fewer people around the table, but it also helps with that feeling of isolation, of not having that large supporting cast that might be able to help the PCs out and that other PCs can provide. Speaking of isolation, try to isolate the party. 
cut them off from the outside reinforcements or escape. That's why many horror stories have the heroes being cut off, such as in The Shining, they're snowed into this haunted hotel, or in The Evil Dead, they can't escape this remote cabin that's in the woods. So you can start it off with everything being you know, very broad, a large urban environment with lots of people, and then as the game continues and you start taking away all of their allies and their assets and their world starts getting smaller and smaller, you know, focusing in on them and making the group feel more and more alone. And not just isolate the characters from the outside world, but isolate them from each other, giving them that vulnerable sense of aloneness. Also, isolating the PCs can be very effective for dramatic moments where you suddenly cut from one player to another. Okay, Todd, you're alone in the locker room beneath the abandoned stadium. What are you doing? I'm going to look for any signs that somebody's been squatting down here. As you're making your way between the rows of lockers, you hear the sound of bare feet running towards where the showers are. Sweet! Then I'm going to hurry after them. As you get closer, your shoes start splashing in water and the floor is very slippery. Are you going to keep running? No, I'm going to slow down, but I'm going to creep towards that shower entrance and try to peek inside. Turning the corner, your flashlight beam reflects off the watery floor, sending ripples of light across the dingy tile walls. An emaciated figure stands in the middle of the room, its bald head just about an inch below the ceiling. And it seems fuzzy. The details are very hard to make out on it, almost like it's some sort of three-dimensional shadow. However, the end of its very long arms that seem just a little bit too long, you see that it's clutching what looks like a severed leg, and it's got pale, smooth skin, and its toenails are painted with a bright purple polish. I'm gonna lift my gun up, and I'm... Okay, Dweebles, you finally reached the office that's overlooking the stadium field. What are you doing? Ugh. Is the door locked? It is, but it looks like somebody's pried that door open a long time ago. So now it's been sealed shut with a latch and a gleaming new combination padlock. I'm going to see if those numbers that we found on that crumpled note work. Okay, so you dial in the numbers 17, 45, and 11 from that scrap of paper, and the lock opens. Okay, then I open the door. Can you roll a perception check for me? Sixth, I failed. The room inside has cinder block walls, and they're covered with this scrawled writing and symbols that's even covering the floor and the ceiling. Someone's installed some bars across the single window that looks out over the field, and it's like a jail cell in here. And in the middle of the floor is just a bare and brown stained mattress. Okay, well then, I'm just gonna close the door and wait for the guys to arrive. A hand touches your shoulder like somebody's come up behind you without you noticing, and you feel another one slide up the front of your shirt as a warm, breathy voice purrs into your ear. Did you come here to play? And on that, let's get to Mike in the parking lot. A good cutaway to another character is a spectacular way of leaving your players with that sense of dread or anticipation which only heightens the mood that you're going for. The hardest part of that is trying to give all your players as much equal time as you can before hitting some dramatic moment and then just suddenly switching to the next player around the table. Isolating the PCs from each other can be pretty difficult to do. There's the player mantra of never split the party, which makes them reluctant to just do that on their own, which is why I've had to hit them every once in a while in the bathroom from time to time when they're alone and, you know, with their pants down. But isolating them can also be done with trap doors and magic and walls that come down separating them from each other, or if you give them some sort of in-game reason why they have to split up, uh, such as they know that they have to go to these two different locations in a certain amount of time in order to achieve their goal, but they don't have enough time to go to both of these locations, you know, one then the other one, so they have to split up, divide the party, and go to these two locations at the same time in order to achieve achieve whatever their goal is. I said earlier that action-y, heroic-type RPGs are a little bit more difficult to make horror, and the reason for that, with games like Dungeons & Dragons, the heroes are larger-than-life characters and capable of defeating their enemies, just like there's heroes here that are leaping to face this giant. But horror doesn't come from being a heroic badass that's got hundreds of hit points at their disposal. Horror comes from helplessness, so make the player characters feel helpless. In most horror, our heroes aren't well-trained, well-armed badasses. They're normal, everyday people who have now been thrust into a horrifying situation. In Alien, our heroes are a group of space truckers who have to deal with a single monster that they know very little about, and all that they have are some homemade flamethrowers and cattle prods. And then we get to Aliens, our heroes are now a squad of capable space marines, armed to the teeth with weapons, cool technology, and a basic idea of what it is that they're about to face. The movie 
doesn't begin becoming horror until they get beaten down. Now, most of them are dead, they have very little ammo, and many of their toys no longer work against these monsters. They're trapped on this remote planet, they're outnumbered, and their world starts becoming, you know, smaller and smaller as they start sealing off different passages and boxing themselves in. So with heroic RPGs, where our characters are extremely capable, create the horror by making them feel helpless. Uh, maybe the wizard casts their offensive spell against the bad guy, and instead of damaging the bad guy, somehow makes the bad guy stronger. And now the PCs realize that all their cool weapons and all their cool abilities that they've used to over overcome all odds previous to this, they're now completely meaningless for the situation that they're now in. Or maybe their spells and their powers, they do work just as effectively as before, but they still aren't enough for whatever this situation is. In Aliens, our Marines' guns, they did work, they did kill aliens just fine. The problem was that there were more aliens than, than they could possibly handle at that time. Neither the living dead, the zombies are weak. They're slow, they aren't intelligent, and our heroes are armed. The helplessness comes from the fact that there were just so many of them, wave after never-ending wave, and their fortifications are not going to hold up against that. So remember that helplessness doesn't necessarily mean that the monster has to be just super powerful and impossible to destroy, more that it, the direct approach, if they try to face this obstacle by just you know going straight at it and attacking it, that clearly is not going to work. Next, leave an unknown to the bad guy. Don't reveal everything at once. Lovecraft once famously wrote that the oldest and strongest fear is fear of the unknown. The unknown factors, uh, what the enemy is, what it's capable of, its weaknesses, where it is, its numbers, or possibly what the monster even looks like, those are all horror seeds. And revealing all of that too early, or just giving the players an opponent that they're already familiar with, that's a wasted opportunity if you're going to be going for horror. So hold some of that information back, but also make it clear to the players that they know that they don't know all of the information because that's the part that you need to have. Uh, take Giant Fishman for example. They are in a lot of games. Dungeons and Dragons, Conan, Call of Cthulhu. By themselves, you know, they're not too scary. I mean, I wouldn't want to meet one of these things on the street, but they're pretty straightforward RPG monsters. And once you see one, you're all like, cool, well, now let's kill it. Roll initiative. But instead of just having the monsters step out in front of them, or everybody can see it and they know exactly what it is, show this thing to the player in pieces. You know, a, a single claw reaches in through a portal, maybe swipes at one of them or grabs something. Uh, then maybe the claw retracts and it's replaced by kind of a large, unblinking eye. And then the smell of fish or something fills the air. Then they hear a splash as this thing dives into the water and swims away. And that leaves a lot of unknown to the players right there. They're going to be sitting there going, what was that? How big was that? Where is it now? And how many of them are there? Those unknowns, that creeping paranoia that happens because you're missing all the information, that is where the horror itself comes from. That's why so many effective monster movies, we don't see the full monster for a while, because once you've shown the monster, it then loses its impact. So, when possible, build up to the reveal. Ramp it up. Maybe at first we only see the gory aftermath and the carnage that this creature can do as they stumble across its victims. Uh, maybe they notice a particular smell in the air. Maybe they hear something scuttling around in the walls, but they never see it or get any idea how big this thing is. So now that the player characters, they know what the bad guy can do, but they don't know what the bad guy necessarily is. Meanwhile, a completely different tactic you could do instead uh, would to show the monster, but then have it evolve or change, making the unknown nature be whatever the nature of that change is. For example, going back to Alien, we see the alien in full light after a dramatic entrance. And then, minutes later, we find this molted skin that tells us that it has now changed. It has become something else. And then we have a giant creature that's mostly hidden in shadows until the very end. Or, coming back to the thing, we get the reveal of the monster's nature very early on. It is horrifying and it is dramatic, but then the unknown factor becomes where, or more precisely, who the monster is now. Because the monster is constantly changing, and not knowing who it is, that's where the real terror is. To help keep things unknown, and not just to the characters, but to the players themselves, 
give familiar things a twist, something that they aren't expecting or they aren't familiar with. Like, let's say that you have an evil wizard in a high fantasy game. Don't just give that wizard spells that the players are all familiar with. Give them something that the players have never seen and therefore don't know how to handle. Instead of casting a classic fireball that everybody and their dog knows, you take the range and the damage and the area of effect of that spell and just change it from fire into something else. Such as all the people in the area of effect, they now start bleeding from their eyes and their nose and their ears for that same amount of damage, but there is no explosion or anything about it that says this is just really a reskinned fireball. Fireball. Or maybe you could have some sort of uh, evil minion or a friendly NPC that wasn't going to survive that you know, spell's damage anyway. They just suddenly you know, swell up and explode and they shower everybody in that area of effect with you know, scalding blood or shards of bone and that's where the damage comes from. So the damage is the same, but the presentation as far as what caused it, that's where it gets weird and disturbing for everybody. And that unknown factor of what was that? How did they do that? Can they do that again? That's where the fear starts coming in because the players feel vulnerable because they know that they don't know what's going on. Next, show the horror, but also know when to pull away. Remember that we're going for uncomfortable, so describe the gore, the wounds, the gritty details as that knife blade you know, slides up underneath a player character's ribs and starts poking around in all their soft organs, uh, or the sound of their buddy's skull you know, crunching in the monster's jaws, then the pop and then their brain comes squelching out their ears, lean into the horrific, lean into the dark matter, but just as importantly as that, know when to stop. And there's two reasons for that. First, if every encounter that they have is at maximum gore, at maximum discomfort, players can become quickly desensitized to that. It loses its impact if it's always set at maximum, so learn to do it when it's going to be the most effective. Uh, dramatic entrance, and then all of a sudden it drops back down, and then it pops back up again once we get to the big climax. Or it can be just kind of a gradual increase as things get steadily and steadily worse, building up to a big climax. Because even after a while, while, even the most shocking and strange things, they can start becoming banal if they're always set at maximum, and you don't want those things to become banal. You want them to be effective tools, so learn when to hold back. That way it's more effective when you want it to be effective. And the second reason is, while horror is to focus on dark subjects with the intent of making us uncomfortable, don't cross the player's line. There are a lot of subjects or levels that a player might draw the line at, and some of them might be more obvious than others are. So while yes, we are purposely pushing ourselves very close to these lines in order to achieve maximum discomfort, there does come a point where it's no longer enjoyable or fun for your players if you step beyond that line. And finding out where your players' lines are, that does require communication. And that's communication from everyone, back and forth. And this is where we begin discussing areas or touching on areas such as X cards or lines and veils. This is a subject that deserves its own video because I do have a lot of opinions on this one. But the short of it is, if you're not familiar with the term X cards, these are a means, either a card or a safe word or other method, for your players to quickly communicate when a line has been crossed and a game has lost it's fun, and that's when the GM or the other players need to stop whatever it is that's going on. Lines and Veils, on the other hand, this is something that's done before the game or between the various sessions in the game. And this is a list of subjects or areas that have hard lines that are not to be crossed, and Veils where we can have it but the camera needs to turn away from it and the players don't need to interact with it. Both of those have their uses, and both require communication from everybody that's at the table, because the reason that we're all here in the first place is in order for us to have fun. So while yes, horror should focus on the horrific and uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable subject matters, a game master needs to learn when and where those limits are in order for all the players to enjoy the game. I will say, though, that one game that really communicates this concept extremely well, and the best that I've actually ever seen on this in an RPG book, is Cult Divinity Lost, with what they call the horror contract. I was very impressed with how they address this topic. Now, this leads us to a very common question that game masters ask whenever they're wanting to try out horror for their group, and that is, should I use the player's own phobias against them? Now, 
I personally hate this question, and the reason that I dislike it is because I think I know what the person is trying to ask when they ask that, but the phrasing of that question is so terrible that I always just have to say, no, never do that. At least not without really talking to your players first about whatever that is, because the key word to that question, uh, why that is a bad question, is the word phobia. Fear comes in a lot of different forms, and not all forms of fear are created equal. Uh, personally, I'm afraid of spiders. I don't like them. They're creepy and they better stay the hell away from me. But I'm not what you would call arachnophobic. There is no irrational, possibly debilitating response. I just don't like spiders. There's also the source of fear that's involved, such as traumas. Personal traumas for the player or someone that's close to them that might make them afraid or uncomfortable whenever they're approached with certain subjects related to that trauma, but that doesn't mean that being able to exploit that trauma for our fun time imagination game is something that you should do because they might not find that enjoyable. For example, let's say that I wanted to run a game that involved a story that had a, a, an alcoholic man who viciously abuses his wife, and one of my players had a personal experience with that, either a parent or themselves or a close friend of theirs, and this is now a very sensitive subject for them, that might not be very fun for them to have to experience that in their game, which they're using to escape real life in order to have fun, and it might be a dick move on your part to intentionally put them through that just to make them uncomfortable for a game. So yeah, definitely talk to your players and get an idea about how they would feel about using their own personal fears or something like that when it comes to a game. And yes, if you do approach it right, and they trust you, and you approach it very well, maybe, just maybe, it'll be perfectly fine to do, but you have to talk to them about it. However, if you're just wanting to use just a regular fear that doesn't have a, a phobia or a trauma or anything to it, a lot of fears really don't translate that well into a game. For example, I'm also afraid of heights. Get me up a 12-foot ladder and my knees start locking up on me. However, not once, not one single time in a tabletop role-playing game has heights ever bothered me. Same thing with spiders. They don't bother me when they're presented to me in games. You know, sure, yeah, you could do something extreme with spiders, like, you know, have them suddenly uh, burst out of a person's eyes, another clutching their face as, you know, blood and spiders are now pouring between their fingers. Okay, yeah, that would definitely get me. But not because it was spiders, because that's a horrifying situation. You could have done that with anything. It could have been worms or maggots or ancient Roman coins or something. It was the presentation. The fact that it was spiders had no change of how my response was. So many of our real-world fears don't translate that well when it comes to a tabletop role-playing game. However, one big problem that I see whenever somebody's trying to focus too much on uh, using the player's real fears in the game in order to tailor it for them is that they're neglecting their fantasy fears. And what I mean by that is these are fears that we don't actually have, but we like to pretend that we're scared by. For example, one of mine is children. Creepy children in horror movies. Man, they get me. I even give baby or childlike qualities to the different monsters in my own games and stories because I find them so damn creepy. However, children in real life, they don't actually scare me. Much. Another one for me is the devil and possessions. Man, I love a good religious horror. I eat those things up. You had a creepy child like in The Exorcist and holy crap, that movie freaks me out. But the devil and demons aren't things that I'm actually remotely afraid of. When I was a little kid, my babysitter kept me up late one night to watch Michael Jackson's Thriller, which scared the crap out of me. Later on, the TV trailer, not even the movie, just the TV trailer for Return of the Living Dead, especially the Tar Man, that thing gave me nightmares. Zombies terrified me. And because of that, starting around the age of 13, I watched every zombie movie I could get my hands on. I love zombie movies because they terrified me as a little kid. Again, I don't think zombies are an actual threat that I'm going to have to face, but I still love being frightened by them. So game masters, when you're talking to your players and you're trying to figure out uh, what their limits are in order to personalize the game, you know, what it is that they don't want, but what it is that they want, and maximize everybody's enjoyment for it, don't just ask about what scares them in real life, but ask them what it is they like pretending to be scared of, because those can actually be the most effective when we're doing this in a game. As you can see, there's a 
a lot of different ways to approach horror. And it's very personal as far as, you know, uh, which subjects and which methods might work for individual players or entire groups that might, you know, how it might work for them. But once you find that moment, you know, where all the players around the table are really getting into it and they're uncomfortable or maybe even a little bit scared, but in the way that's got that, that energy or excitement, you know, where everybody's got that energy of fear going on, but they're excited, but they're also tense. There is nothing that's quite like that. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or how to's, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, amigos, stay awesome. Okay, can we finally get back to my character in the shower? Because I'm still like freaking out about that.